Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. We are in a new sermon series, as you can see, called Keep It Simple, Jesus Has Saved You. And that's very fitting for Reformation Sunday, because that's really what the Reformation was all about, was keeping it simple, getting back to what God has done for us, in that Jesus has saved us. Over the next few weeks, this will also serve as our stewardship sermon series, where we we look at how God is using our time, talent, and treasures for use in his kingdom, but you can't have that unless you're keeping it simple, unless you're getting it back to the basics of what God has done for us. It's important to keep it simple, yet oftentimes we overcomplicate things, don't we? I'm, I'm really good at overcomplicating things. We do that with our stewardship. We do that with our, our faith as we try to live out our faith. We make it way more complicated than it needs to be. And we also see that all throughout the scriptures, that people are always trying to overcomplicate things. We see it in the Gospels. We see it in Paul's writings. We, we see it in the Old Testament, And we're always reminded of this one simple point, that Jesus has saved us. That's what everything points to in our faith. And so what I want to do today is kind of get us into this series. I want to look at our our gospel lesson this morning because we're we're seeing this already. People are overcomplicating things. Our gospel lesson today comes from John chapter 10, which is just after the famous Good Shepherd stuff. Some of you guys maybe have like pictures in your homes quoting the beginning part of John chapter 10 where where Jesus says things like, I'm the good shepherd. I'm the gate or the door of the sheep. And there's great promise there. But then towards the second half of John chapter 10, people come up to Jesus and guess what they do? They don't keep it simple. They actually overcomplicate it. We see this in our gospel lesson here in John chapter 10. Where John writes, he says, At that time, the feast of dedication took place at Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple in the colonnade of Solomon. So the Jews gathered around him and said to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Now, at first glance, it looks like the the Jewish people are coming up to Jesus and saying, hey, Jesus, we're so confused by all these parables. We're so confused by these I am statements. Like, just tell us plainly. Like, keep it simple, Jesus. Are you the Christ? Or should we expect somebody else? Jesus, are are you the Savior? Just tell us plainly if you're the one. It looks like they're, they're asking Jesus to keep it simple. But if you look at the context that John gives us here for these questions that Jesus is receiving, we see that they're not actually trying to keep it simple. They're actually trying to overcomplicate it even more. You notice the context? When they come up, what's what's going on when these Jews come up to Jesus? John tells us, what is it? Feast of dedication. Anybody know what that is? Right? Anybody celebrate the Feast of Dedication lately? Right? We, we, we as Christians, we really don't have this one anymore. Uh, but the Feast of Dedication, actually today, if you notice what season is this in, it's, it's the winter season. Today, if you have Jewish friends, they celebrate the Feast of Dedication, and we call it Hanukkah. Anybody heard of Hanukkah before? Okay, right? That's Feast of Dedication and Hanukkah are, are the same event. And so back at the Feast of Dedication, the time of Jesus, what they would remember at Hanukkah or what they would remember at the Feast of Dedication was how God's temple, God's house, had been overrun by the Greeks. The Greeks had taken over, the Greeks had taken over Jerusalem, overrun God's temple, had all their Greek gods all over the place, and they cried out to God. They wanted a rescuer. They wanted a deliverer to come to to drive the Greeks out so that they could once again worship Yahweh, their God, in the temple, in God's house. And guess what happened? Their great deliverer came. This is a couple hundred years before Jesus. His name was Judas Maccabees. 
At Judas Maccabees, he rode into Jerusalem. And as he came into Jerusalem, guess what they did? They waved these big palm fronds up and down, and they laid them on the ground as he came in. Does that sound familiar? Kind of sounds like Palm Sunday, right? They'd done it for Judas Maccabees before. And Judas Maccabees came in, and guess what he did to the Greeks? He drove them out of the temple. He drove them out of Jerusalem. <clears throat> he restored the area back to the worship of Yahweh, and they celebrated that. And so that's what they were doing. They were remembering how Judas Maccabees had come in and driven out their political enemies, and how they were once again able to worship their God. And it's in the middle of that celebration, in the middle of that feast of dedication, that they come up to Jesus and they ask him a question. Tell us plainly. Right? Are, are you the one? Are you the Christ? Are you the one? Are you the Savior that we're expecting? But in asking that question, what are they really asking Jesus? Are you going to be that Savior like Judas Maccabees? Because what's their problem they have now? Is it the Greeks that is their problem? No, it's the Romans. Right? Are, are you going to be the one that's going to drive out these, these pesky Romans? Are, are you going to be the ones to destroy our political enemies? Like, tell us plainly. And really, they're asking, are you going to be the one to build the house of the Lord in, in our image and what we want? And look what Jesus says. Jesus says, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me, but you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. He's like, I've, I've been telling you. I've been showing you. Well, look what I've done. Look at the mercy. Look at the forgiveness. Look at the healing. And of course, John is recording this after the resurrection, and, and John is almost like, by including this, is saying, like, look ahead to what Jesus is going to do where he's going to die a criminal's death, but destroy death and be, be raised and come back with forgiveness and mercy. Like, look at, look at Jesus. Jesus is saying, that's what I'm about. Right? My, my works plainly say, you guys are overcomplicating things with your agenda of what you think God's house should be. In other words, keep it simple. <laughs> I'm in the process of saving you, Jesus is saying. If they were overcomplicating things, we see this in our Old Testament lesson as well. I love this from 2 Samuel. King David is God's people's king. Right? He's a man after God's own heart. And things at the beginning of 2 Samuel are going well for King David. And King David, you know, the kingdom of God is expanding through him and, and his kingdom is expanding. And, and David's got a pretty nice palace. Right? When David's at home, he's looking around, he's like, oh, this is, this is nice, right? This is nice. And he basically goes to God, and he says, God, like, I got this nice palace, God, I need to build you a nice house. David says, like, I, I got this palace, I got, I, got, I got all these ornate things around me, like, God, you need a house. God, let me build you a house. But you notice what God says to David? I love this. Through the prophet, he says, Go tell my servant David, Thus says the Lord, Would you build me a house to dwell in? I have not lived in a house since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this day. But I've been moving about in a, twin, in a tent for my dwelling. So as David says to God, God, I'm going to build you a house, what does God say? I, I don't need a house. David, do you, do you not know what I'm doing? Like, like, I haven't dwelled in a house. Like, I've been active amongst my people, saving them from their enemies. I don't want to sit around in a palace. I don't want to sit around in a house. David, you think I need a house, but God says, I don't need a house because I'm on the move rescuing my people. In other words, David, you're adding all these things. You're overcomplicating things. I don't need a house. I want to be on the move with my people. Yet, yet David adds all these things that he thinks he needs to do for God. He, he overcomplicates it. He, he's not keeping it simple. Letting God save them. And I was thinking about that. And man, we, we, can, we can look at the Bible and say, okay, yeah, they didn't get it, but I think we do the same thing. We overcomplicate things. And we, we add all these things to what we have to do. 
That's what the Reformation was all about. This is a little bit more modern day than scriptural times, but 500 years ago, this was happening. Right? The church overcomplicated things. The church was saying, you know what you got to do? If you messed up, you got to do this thing called penance. And penance was this thing, not simply repentance, where you, you turn to God and you, you receive forgiveness. Penance was this active working of what you had to do. Right? You, you had to do these works, and, and part of penance could have involved paying the church money. Because guess what the church was doing in the, around the year 1500? They were trying to build this house for the Lord. They, they were building all these cathedrals, and they needed money. And so they had these things called indulgences that you were told you had to buy if you messed up. And depending on how bad your sin was, the more indulgences you had to die. And when you, when you died, even if you trusted in Jesus, they taught you, didn't, you don't go to be with Jesus, but rather you go to this place called purgatory. And if your loved one has died, man, they're, they're suffering in purgatory. And oh, if you care about grandma, you would give us some money so that she could get out of purgatory. And they, they overcomplicated things. And that's what Luther had an issue with. And so we can look 500 years ago, we can see that the church was overcomplicating things, but, but what about today? Where are you in your faith tempted to overcomplicate things and add all these works that you have to do? For me, growing up, um, when I was a young child, um, I didn't really go to church. And so when I looked to God and what God wanted, I was, I was Christian. I, I was one of those kids that was baptized in the church and then didn't come back to the church for until many, many years later. My parents were Christians. We just didn't go to church. And so when I looked to faith, I, I looked to my grandparents who were very, very spiritual, and they went to church. But what my grandma taught me as a young child, I don't know if it's exactly what the scriptures taught, because she taught me, Mark, you better be good. You don't want to make Jesus cry, Mark. She would say that all the time. You don't want to make Jesus cry. And so I would feel this pressure that I almost had to be perfect. That yes, Jesus forgave me. We talked about that. But you almost had to get an A minus on the test and then he'd bring you up to an A plus. You know, that's, that's how I viewed God as a young child. And, and actually through most of my life until pretty much I got like the high school and college. We added all these things and all this pressure that we have to do. Are, are you doing those things? Are you listening to those voices of the, almost the accuser telling you, you got to do more. You got to work harder, or maybe you'll make Jesus cry. And maybe you don't view it that way, but I think we add these things onto ourselves. Or maybe, right, we're, we're coming up, we're, we're, we're nearing the end of a political season, right? Maybe, maybe you're like the, 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 the Jewish people who came up to Jesus in the temple on the Feast of Dedication, and you go, you know what? Are you the Savior we're looking for? And maybe you feel like, you know, unless this person wins in this political office, then maybe Jesus can't do his work. And so unless this guy or this gal wins, you know, we, we got to get them in this certain office, whether it's local or national, whatever it happens to be, you know, and, and rather than letting Jesus be the king of the universe, we put all this work on our political system to be our savior. Rather than trusting that Jesus has saved us and is, is reigning in the universe, maybe that's the pressure that you're adding on, overcomplicating things. We see this all the time. We're always wanting to add stuff. We're always wanting to do more, work harder, add things to our faith. It's, it's like we're trying to build the house of the Lord on our own like King David. Yet when God says to King David, I don't need a house, like I'm with my people. I'm like actively saving my people. Like I love our whole Old Testament lesson. It's, it's, it's a powerful chapter. Look what God says. He says, David, as you're trying to build me a house, like I don't need you to build me a house, but guess what I'm going to do, God says. God says, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Who's the one that's building the house? God is. And of course, we know that house that God builds through the offspring of David. Looking back on this, we know who that is whose kingdom will never end. It's Jesus. 
God says, David, through your line, even though you're messed up, even though you're confused, even though you're overcomplicating it, I'm going to actually build you a house to rescue you and save you. And in that house, that kingdom will never end. And that king is Jesus. Jesus is going to build the house that you might dwell secure in. And that's what we see. Right, as we overcomplicate things, we, we see that, that Jesus comes and he, and he dies and he rises. That not even death can separate him from us, from saving us. No matter what's going on, Jesus has saved you. And, and that's what, what, what God is trying to tell David here. Don't worry, I've got you. I'm building the house. You can dwell secure in it. Martin Luther realized this in the Reformation. That's what the whole Reformation was all about. He would quote things like the Apostle Paul in our, in, our New, in our New Testament lesson. For by grace you've been saved through faith. Like This is like the Lutheran rally cry. And this is not of your own doing. It's a gift of God, not a result of work, so that no one may boast. God has saved you. He doesn't need you to do anything else. <laughs> even when you're lost, even if you're not making an A-, minus, if you're making an F-, minus, guess what? Jesus has taken on your sin. He's taken on your death. He's been raised, and he gives you this gift of salvation. There's nothing else you have to do. And for those Jews that were looking for the Feast of Dedication, who were longing for this political Savior and overcomplicating things, Jesus reminds them of this as well. And I love these words of Jesus here. He says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them. They follow me, I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Jesus has you. You are one of his sheep. You will never perish. No one will snatch you out of the Father's hand because Jesus, he's built you this house, and you can dwell securely in it. So on this Reformation Sunday, regardless of what chaos is going on around you outside in the world, listen to the words of Jesus. Keep it simple, knowing that Jesus has saved you. Amen. May the peace that passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus to life everlasting. Amen.